Christ Sunday morning. All right, we are here to answer questions from our live Q and A. We just did a whole webinar on vaginal hormones, how to prescribe them, and we had tons of questions and not enough time to answer all of them. So Adele is here. She's going to shout out the questions, and we are going to see how it goes. Okay. So how did the FDA come up with the safety information on estrogen and why haven't they changed this? Okay, so the FDA has a box labeling on all estrogen products that says it's going to cause stroke, blood clots, heart attacks, probable dementia, and you have to take progesterone with estrogen if you have a uterus. Now, that is true. That is not true for local vaginal hormones, which are very low dose. In fact, it's not true at all. And so what happened was in 2003, which is more than 20 years ago, the FDA put this blanket warning on and said, all hormones are the same things. High dose hormones used for hot flashes and low dose hormones used for vaginal atrophy. They're all the same thing. They all get the same warning labels. But it was not true then and it's not true now. And we have lots and lots of data to show that they are very different things. But the the FDA has not updated their uh, guidance since 2003, no matter how much we yell and scream at the FDA, and we have been trying. So we are continuing to have advocacy campaigns to try to get this changed, and we have a lot of work to do. But I will repeat, vaginal estrogen does not cause stroke, blood clots, heart attack, dementia, cancer, and does not need progesterone if you have a uterus. So please, please, please understand that the warning labels are actually misleading. Can someone plan a pregnancy while using vaginal estrogen or should they stop it while trying to get pregnant? So vaginal estrogen should not uh, interfere with pregnancy and trying to get pregnant. That being said, we don't have unlimited studies. I would love to see more studies on this. But just to give you some um, comfort, um, when people do IVF, they are on high doses of oral estrogen during IVF. In fact, when you're trying to get pregnant, you have high levels of estrogen in your bloodstream. Now, we don't have perfect studies to show how does the sperm swim through vaginal estrogen creams. Um, and so that's something that I would love to see more data on. But in and of itself, estrogen and low dose estrogen that doesn't affect your bloodstream should not affect you trying to uh, make a baby. But we still have uh, need more data on this topic. Can vaginal estradiol be used during an acute UTI? Will it help symptoms at all? So um, I think of vaginal estrogen as something that should be used to prevent UTIs. And if you're getting lots of urinary tract infections, then you need vaginal estrogen to prevent future urinary tract infections. If you have an active infection, um, adding vaginal estrogen probably won't hurt you, um, but it's not going to fix the current bacteria that is there. You do want to get a culture and get antibiotics. Can you please talk about intra rosa? When and why to start this? Do you stop? estrogen creams if it's not effective and then start intra rosa or do you do them both at the same time? Yep, we have other videos on this as well. Intra rosa is vaginal DHEA. It can be used instead of vaginal estrogen in addition to vaginal estrogen or uh, on its own as first line therapy. Now it's kind of expensive and sometimes hard to get your insurance to cover it. So it's often not used with vaginal estrogen. If you had get your hands on intra rosa and vaginal DHEA, it is a nightly medication that you put vaginally every single night at bedtime. It has just palm oil and DHEA, which can be very moisturizing and lubricating, and a small percentage of people hate it because it's too messy uh, and there's too much discharge, but most people really like this medication. What is nice about vaginal DHEA is it is the only FDA-approved product that has some androgen, meaning some uh, sort of uh, ability to form testosterone in it, um, and we know that the bladder, the urethra, the vulva, and the vagina have testosterone receptors, so just using estrogen may not be enough for everybody. So if you find that vaginal estrogen at the right doses and watch our other videos to figure out the right doses may not be enough for you, or if it's not enough for you, still have urgency, you're still getting UTIs, switching to vaginal DHEA may be a viable option. So for patients using vaginal cream, is there a recommended period of time they should abstain from intercourse to allow the product to absorb? Are there any problems with penile exposure if it's exposed to cream. We get this question all the time and we answered it in the lecture and I can't answer this enough times. So men, if you are having sex with a penis, men have an estrogen level of 25 menopause, your estrogen levels are zero. So a menopausal woman and a man, the man has more estrogen than the woman. 
When you use vaginal estrogen cream, your levels, your blood levels don't go higher than 25. They don't even go higher than 16 really, or if high at all. And so putting it on a penis is not going to elevate a man's estrogen levels to any measurable level. It's not gonna absorb through the penis in any measurable level. That being said, if you're trying to get it to absorb through your vaginal walls, uh, if it gets all over the penis, it's not then getting into your vaginal walls. So you may wanna delay when you use your vaginal estrogen and when you're having sex. That being said, you're not going to hurt a penis. You're not, the man will not develop breast tenderness. They will not become a woman. These doses are not high enough to really affect your partner. Um, but certainly many patients don't elect to do it at the time of intercourse. How does the E string differ from the fem ring? Very important question. There are two FDA approved vaginal rings in menopause. One treats your whole body and your vagina and bladder, and the other one just treats your vagina and bladder. So a femoring is a systemic or whole body hormone therapy, which means if you have a uterus, you need progesterone of some sort to protect your uterus from overgrowth. But a femoring will treat your hot flashes, your night sweats, your bones, um, your brain fog, uh, and it will also prevent urinary tract infections and help with the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. The E-string is a smaller, very low dose um, of a vaginal estrogen that just locally excretes uh, estrogen over a three month period, um, but doesn't treat your hot flashes, your bones, your, your night sweats or things like that. So if you're just treating GSM, you want an E-string. If you're treating GSM plus hot flashes, a fem ring plus progesterone, if you have a uterus is a very viable option. How should we advise patients who have active breast or endometrial cancer? So if you have active breast or endometrial cancer, please talk to your doctor, but please get your doctor to watch these videos to understand how horrible having genitourinary syndrome of menopause truly is. And so we have research that shows people with active breast cancer have no increased risk of mortality on vaginal hormones. We have lots of data to show that vaginal estrogen does not cause breast cancer. We even have data to show that people with a history of endometrial cancer or ovarian cancer do not have an increased risk of recurrence or blood clots if they use vaginal hormones. So there is overwhelmingly positive data out there. That being said, cancers can be hormone sensitive and doctors are very, very concerned and nervous and they wanna keep you alive for as long as possible. My argument is I wanna keep you alive as long as possible, but I also wanna keep you living. And if you are living with chronic urinary tract infections, pelvic pain, and you can't have the intimacy that you wanna have in your life, that is worth a conversation with your doctor about shared decision-making, about what makes sense for you. And this is my plea to beg researchers, we must research this at the highest level because genitourinary syndrome of menopause kills people and really ruins their quality of life. So we have a lot of work to do. Okay, last question. Last question. <laughs> How do you select as a prescriber, estriol cream versus insert versus tablet versus ring? Is there one you typically start people on? That is a great question. It depends on what location I'm in, who the patient is, what their preferences are, and what is the easiest and most affordable thing for them to do. So if I'm at the VA hospital and I can use any medicine that I want, sometimes I use Intrarosa because I like it and it, it really helps with the androgen piece. If I am at my local clinic and, and, and cost is an issue for patients, then a $13 or tube of estrogen cream is gonna be my go-to. If the patient is like, creams are disgusting, I don't like them, then I'm gonna go for the vaginal estrogen insert. If a patient has dementia and poor dexterity, I may go for the vaginal estrogen ring that we can change out in the clinic. The key to this is what can your patient afford, what will they do and continue to do till death do they part, and um, um, what is their preference? So I actually show my patients all of these and I let them choose and with the understanding that we wanna go with the most affordable thing that they're actually gonna use and keep using. So this was so fun. Everyone say yay to Adele for asking these questions. We're so happy to have her here. Um, but thank you for joining us from this Q&A and we hope we answer your questions. Please subscribe to our channel and please share this with your doctor and your friends.